All right, good morning and or afternoon, depending on which time zone you're calling in from. Uh, welcome to Demystifying E-Auctions, presented to you by PMAC. This is Rick Cleveland speaking. I'm the Director of Learning Development and Accreditation for PMAC, and I've had the opportunity to work with RSVP on putting together this program uh, with the assistance of the Ontario government. The intent of demystifying e-auctions, both as a webinar and also as a uh, e-book that you're able to download, is to set up for small and medium-sized companies to understand some of the terminology about e-auctions and whether or not it seems to be a right fit for them. Uh, the terms e-procurement and e-commerce quite often interchangeable, sometimes with e-auction. E-auction is a component that may or may not be part of your total e-procurement and e-commerce cycle. Uh, if it is part of it, then uh, it gives you an opportunity to have a certain reach that you may not have because of the prohibitive costs of having to travel to other places where you can reach them much more easily by web. So in today's uh, webinar, we're going to go through uh, the overview and fit. Uh, e-auction business decisions, some of the terms and methods that are available, different types of e-auctions that are out there. We'll take a look at some of the processes. How do you set up for an e-auction? What are some of the risks and liabilities that you're likely to face? What payment considerations do you have to have in mind? And of course, technical requirements, which is one of the more prohibitive uh, setups in the e-auction. Um, we'll, we'll try to help you understand uh, how easy it can be to get yourself started. We will talk about ethics, um, and we'll make sure that uh, we go through some buyer and seller tips specifically. We will, as we go through this, switch back and forth between whether you're the buyer or the seller in the e-auction. Uh, it's important for us to ensure that we take a look as part of the supply chain to ensure that we encompass both directions, upward and downward flow. So, the objectives. If you're looking to expand your business by buying or selling through electronic auctions, the first question is, is the auction a good fit for the strategy that we have? Uh, if your goods or services have sufficiently high value to generate a reasonable savings, or if they have the ability to impact market share by going through an auction process, then e-auction is probably a good fit. If it's a good or service that's capable of being defined precisely, that you can use pictures, specs, and drawings, then e-auction is certainly a beneficial tool to help you reach markets that you may not otherwise reach. There have to be sufficient number of players. I mean, if you were to set up an e-auction and only one person were to come in and bid on it, clearly the benefit would be lacking. Some of the benefits that we do get from an e-auction, uh, we have a real-time bidding approach that gives us true market prices. It's a transparent process. We can reduce costs and overhead. We can reduce our processing time. We can increase our market exposure without having to incur travel costs. We can certainly improve communications by making sure we have a consistent message going to all participants at once. Uh, tangibly, we can improve our cash flow and return on investment. <clears throat> also gives us the ability of repeatability. Uh, once we have set up the e-auction, we can repeat the process more easily. We can also repeat uh, the auction process for those items without having to reinvest a lot of time and energy. Obviously, once you've done it once, you have it on file. It's something that makes it rather easy. It gives you an opportunity for market transparency. When you first start in the auction, let's assume that you're trying to purchase something. Um, think of a product offhand. Let's say we were trying to, to purchase a, a new software suite for, for something that we had in place. And you might have a ballpark estimate of what you think the pricing is going to be set at. Once you start with the e-auction, you're going to get the initial bids coming in from suppliers who are willing to, uh, to, to offer their products and services. 
initially that gives you a chance to see how close are they in line to what you were thinking your pricing would be in that market. As well, it gives you an opportunity to see how quickly the pricing changes. So if everyone's coming in with bids of $4 million and you know the, the next person comes in at 3.5 and then within two days you've gotten down to $2 million, then you know you're dealing with a market that has a lot of flexibility within it. Uh, if the pricing is moving much more slowly, then you've got a pretty good sense of what the real market pricing is and what can and can't be negotiated beyond that. So market transparency is, is one of the benefits of e-auction as a result. Uh, you do get a decreased error rate. You tend to have information that, uh, because it's being shared in the same format with the same people, you tend to get more or less the same interpretation of the data. It helps you with qualifying partners. Uh, with the e-auction process, you can set up a series of questionnaires and meetings beforehand. Uh, and then once you've narrowed it down to the customers that customers or suppliers that you wish to deal with, uh, you have the ability to further qualify them as well. Increases your ease of comparison. Certainly increases your market reach with an e-auction. Uh, obviously, you can go anywhere the internet is. Um, it's just a matter of, of getting the message out there that uh, the e-auction is available. There are certain intangible benefits as well. So we'll take a look at the e-auction process overall. First of all, we want to start with our business strategy. Does it make sense with what we want to do? So we, we start with an e-auction investigation once we made the business decision. Are we going to go with e-auction, yes or no? Obviously, if the answer is no, we're at the end of this process now. But if the answer is yes, we believe that an e-auction is the right decision for us based on our strategy, now we need to take a look at what formats are available. So is this something we want to do in-house? Or is this something that we want to conduct through a broker? Depending on the outcome of that, we'll have to make a determination on the platform that we're going to use. Is the in-house development of an e-auction site something that we're capable of doing? Uh, is there an app that we can uh, purchase and, and or lease in order to use for this process? Um, if we go through the in-house development, how long will it take to set up this? If we decide that we're going to go through a broker, then how do we qualify which broker to deal with? Uh, how do we assess their site uh, and capabilities? And again, employing an e-auction app, how do we set that up? Regardless of which platform you decide to go with, now you're going to have questions on the e-auction setup itself. What is the duration? Is this something that I'm going to put out for bid and I want responses in a week? Or is this something that's going to be out there for a month or is this even longer term? Is it closed or open? In other words, will people bid once? Will people be able to bid consistently against one another? And at the end of it, do I select somebody from the bid or do I use the bid process to enter into negotiations? And is there an anticipated price when I set this up? Is there something that I'm going to set as, unless somebody reaches this price, I'm not making a, a purchase or a sale? depending on which side of the auction I'm on. Alternatively, it could be uh, that you, you don't set it up at that price, and if you don't communicate that, you may find yourself required uh, to accept a price that may or may not be what you were hoping for. Um, you can set a minimum price. If you're looking to sell something, you may say that I'm not going to sell it unless I get a bid that's higher than X. Uh, likewise, you can have a maximum price. If I'm going to buy something, I'm going to buy something, but I'm not going to pay more than this price for it. And therefore, whatever that price is, if people's um, responses don't come in at a sufficient level for me to make a decision and to say, yes, that's a value to me, then I, I can reject all offers. Again, this is something that from an ethics standpoint should be set up up front with the participants. In either case, this minimum or maximum price that you set up is referred to as our reserve bid. <clears throat> so with our e-auction terms and methods, we want to determine, sorry, we want to determine if we're going to participate in-house or go outside. 
and uh, whether we're going to build our own system or purchase something that's available. So for buyers, um, if they don't have the resources available, it's much easier to outsource things with the seller. Uh, as applications may or may not exist, you can develop everything and support it in-house. Uh, if there's a lack of resource software, you may have the time and resources to set things up because since you're doing the selling, you can set it to your timeline. Some of the enablers that we need to look at on whether e-auctions will be attractive, it is a low-cost and highly proficient technical application. There are options out there that are accessible. Uh, it is generally accepted, so there's been a meaningful increase in the number of e-auction transactions over the last few years. This is especially true in Europe. It's also true uh, in dealing with certain governments, such as the U.S. government, that there's been an increase in the use of e-auctions over the last few years. And they're also gaining traction in Canada's public sector because of our requirement for transparency. <clears throat> the first party online auctions don't use brokers. They're first party and therefore they're something that we do ourselves. If we're the seller, we possess the sale item and we deal directly with the buyer to complete payment delivery. Uh, this is a preferable e-auction when we have our in-house staff members who are skilled and have the time available to help set things up and put it in motion. For a second party uh, online auction, then we'll be looking at brokers. We're looking for an outside company that organizes the payment and delivery on behalf of ourselves. They may take a percentage of the sale. It may be a fixed fee, whatever is conducted through their outsourced application. Some of the key steps that we want to make sure we're going through. Uh, again, the first thing we need to understand, as we should with any business decision that we take, is does it fit our strategy? So we need to define our business requirements. Um, what exactly are we looking to set up here? What business decisions from a financial, legal, investment, and target forecast are in place? Do we have the resources in-house, or do we need to invest outside? What format do we want to look at, inside development or purchasing an app? What's our sales infrastructure look like? Or if we're on the purchasing side, what's our purchase infrastructure set up? Uh, what products do we start with? It's, are we going to set up e-auction as a business strategy and then just start with one or two items as the uh, alpha and beta tests that we're going to go through? And then what will the auction infrastructure itself look like? And we'll get through in a little bit to the number of different types of auctions that are out there. Um, how will we invite our potential partners? How are we going to reach them in the first place? Uh, what sort of duration are we looking at? Are we going to go with closed bid or open bid, anticipated price? Is it a, a min-max reserve? Are we going to invite all potential partners outright, or are we going to uh, use marketing as a key to get the knowledge of what our e-auction is and pre-qualify certain partners. We might do this through uh, uh, an invitation to tender or one of the RFP type processes. Make sure that the right parties are at the table. We want to make sure that we clearly document all requirements before we get into the stages of actually issuing it. How are we going to uh, identify product specs, configuration parameters? How are we going to identify uh, which partners are considered capable and which are not, which ones do our business processes allow us to easily set up, and which one, as many of us have, uh, specific requirements in setting up a, a business partner, what is their financial, what is their quality, what is their management mindset, all of these questions. How do we identify that when we're going through an auction process? So it doesn't become any easier at this stage as opposed to going out and doing uh, individual selection of suppliers, uh, what becomes easier is once we start the auction process, we get a better feel of what the market is like out there. Um, will we hold Q&A sessions? There's one way to clearly document uh, what we're doing. Um, any items that were not previously covered off, we'll have an opportunity to discuss them with all of the people who are going to be a part of the auction. And how will we monitor the auction? Are we just going to set it up and just wait until the end and take a look at the best price, or are we going to monitor as the auction goes through, review the flow of how it's working? 
Uh, I certainly consider that reviewing the flow of how it's going is, is a better method because, again, it gives you that market visibility. How quickly are prices changing in the auction? How quickly are our specs being upgraded? How many times is the same buyer coming back to the table and saying, okay, that guy outbid me, now I'm going to try to outbid him again? These are key items of interest for anyone, certainly on the purchasing side, but also on the selling side, to understand the market and to understand for future reference, uh, is this a long-term partner potential for me or is this, again, uh, someone that I would invite back into the auction because it's somebody who's going to help me get to the price I want more quickly. Um, sorry, just on that last slide, just one more thing to point out is that within the public sector, 43% of the bids that come through are awarded to small and medium enterprises, or SMEs. Yeah, I think it's important that we note, as we've set this auction up, mainly to help small and medium enterprises understand whether or not e-auctions are the right tool for them to use. Uh, clearly, based on the results of 43% of public sector bids being awarded to SMEs, it suggests that uh, SMEs do have an opportunity to bid against the big guys. So we need to have an understanding of some of the roles. Obviously, because the decision to go to e-auction has to be your strategy, you need to start at the top of the company. Uh, we need to make sure that we have uh, purchasing involved, especially if uh, what we're looking for is e-auction from a purchasing standpoint. We want to make sure that we understand what are the specs, what are the uh, engineering R&D requirements, et cetera. Um, from a sales and marketing perspective, we want to make sure that we have understanding of our customers and our markets. If we're purchasing product, we want to make sure that we're purchasing stuff that's going to meet the needs of our production and transformation to then go out to our customers. Alternatively, if we're on the selling side, uh, there might be a question of why do we need purchasing involved in the e-auction side if we're looking to sell product. Uh, having purchasing involved also helps them to understand what are their requirements that, uh, that, that they should be determining as they set policy and procedure in their department to maximize the benefit of the company. Of course, finance and IT have to be in there as well. Uh, we, we have a question, is it a general practice to get an RFQ sent prior to doing an e-auction? And the practice changes from industry to industry and, in fact, from country to country as well. And since e-auctions are international, there is some merging of that. Um, depending on what industry you're in, generally speaking, uh, the RFQ prior to the e-auction, if it's set up properly, then we're going back to the determination of who's going to participate. We can use that RFQ and set it up structured in such a way that the applicants or respondents to the RFQ understand the purpose in responding to this RFQ is to be invited into an e-auction. It is relatively common to do it that way. Uh, and again, you want to make sure that they understand up front that this is the, the outcome of it, that it's not uh, responding to this RFQ is going to get you uh, immediately into our business. It's Probably more common to go that way than to do the e-auction first and then to come out with an RFQ. And if you do set it up that way, it has been done, you must identify in the e-auction that the top five applicants will be invited into an RFQ process or whatever it is. And in fact, the e-auction becomes the primary of the RFQ process and you then just enter into negotiation from that point. But you do want to, from an ethical standpoint, ensure that uh, people have a clear understanding of what the outcome is. So making sure that we have not just a single department working on the e-auction, but to have this strategy set by the company and to ensure that the different departments understand what is expected of them, how they participate, and what benefit comes to the company in the long run is very important to getting it set up right. Uh, these, of course, are only the primary roles. You're also going to have quality people, engineering, R&D, operations, definitely legal, um, especially because of the nature of contracting and RFQs. You may even have HR involved because of the internal organizational structure that's required and having people, the right people put onto the team that you need to have in there. 
Um, and of course, critical to it all, whether you do it in-house or outsource it, is to ensure that you've got the IT group because you've got to have your data architecture, your integration, your technical framework. Um, you want the e-auction to be as integrated as possible so that you don't have to take everything and then re-enter data into a separate database. You want to be able to uh, manipulate response and create whatever type of data capture you want to have. So, purchasing and e-auction methods and parameters. Um, we want to make sure that we take a look at scoring. We want to establish what are our parameters uh, for scoring. In other words, how will we determine who is the winner of the auction? Generally, if we're making a purchase through an e-auction, we're looking for the lowest price. But there might be more parameters than lowest price. There might be sustainability initiatives. There might be quality requirements. Uh, there might actually be legal requirements that not everyone who attends the e-auction is able to meet. So you want to make sure that your scoring is set up and set up clearly and succinctly for the participants. Excuse me, my throat's getting dry. Um, quality, obviously, is, is one of the more important parts of the scoring as well as price. <clears throat> you want to make sure that you set up your duration. Uh, is it going to be uh, an open, limited, closed time duration? Is it going to be invitation only? Do people have the ability to review information and then you open the bidding at a certain point and close it at a certain point? Or is the bidding open from the time that they first are able to view the information? and then you just close it at, at whatever your closing date is. Um, and again, it could even be that it's a longer term initiative and you'll make purchases off of the e-auction in between the first and the last closing date. So determination is based on what is the market norm. So it helps to understand, especially if you're going through an external app, what are other people in your industry doing? How do they normally run these auctions? Um, what is the shelf life of the product also has a difference. Obviously, if you're dealing with uh, perishables or you know any products that, uh, that have a short life cycle, then you want to make sure that your duration is short enough to capitalize on that. Uh, and also, how soon do you need to either acquire or move the product, depending on whether you're on the purchasing or the sales side. <laughs> Another question is, what is the number of bidders? How many people do I want to invite into this? Do I want to just hit a massive blast and get as many people as I can so I can pick my top five? Or is that just way too much information for me to deal with? Do I want to make sure that I limit it to existing uh, suppliers and or customers that I've already pre-qualified and just get down to the, the uh, best opportunity from my existing base? And what type of requests are we going to use with this? Are we going to go with an invitation to bid with a request for information, a request for quotation, or a request for proposal? So again, the e-auction can be used to help set up uh, and identify for you how to get to that next phase of moving into the RFQ and RFP, or it can be set up as the outcome of having gone through the invitation to bid or request for information process those are who, who have been selected as the top candidates will now be invited to the e-auction. In either case, it is important to wade into these e-auctions with market knowledge already in hand. You should have done your homework before starting this so you can help identify whether you're getting uh, valid, solid responses uh, from the partners that, that you have chosen to invite. <coughs> Visibility. Um, we want to make sure that we have uh, an understanding of what visibility each of the participants will have to the others bid. This has a huge impact on the psyche of the participants. Um, if there's no visibility to them, if all they can see is their own bid, that may push them towards giving their best price outright or to giving a price. And sometimes you give a visibility of a ranking, uh, you're currently number seven. Well, if I know that I'm number seven, I know that I need to sharpen my pencil a bit, or in the case of uh, if I'm trying to sell something, then as the buyer, I need to now uh, open my wallet a little wider. In either case, um, when you can see your bid and see where you are, there can be a tendency to 
overextend oneself. You've probably all seen, heard stories in live auctions where people are in a room together and they start bidding and somebody ends up buying something that was well beyond what they wanted. They paid much more money than they intended to pay for it. Well, believe it or not, the same type of behavior exists on online auctions and e-auction methodology. Um, if it's an open auction where you can see all those bids, then people tend to be a little tighter with things, uh, but it can also provide a higher level of competition because people might be looking at the others saying, okay, if other people in our marketplace are doing this, it gives them instantaneous benchmarking, and they can start to look at their own pricing structure and say, we have to find ways to shave things out of here, and it can make the market more competitive as a result. So your, your choice of what visibility is there, whether everyone can see each other's bids or whether they see only their own bid uh, or their own bid and the winning bid and with or without a ranking are various options that you have available to you. Within pricing, uh, we want to make a decision. Do we want the minimum bid, the lowest level that a seller is going to accept? Or in the case of uh, the buyer with the maximum, um, the highest price that the seller is going to sell for, we set up a reserve grid. Uh, it's usually a hidden reserve, and you may let them know that there is a reserve bid, and then your response to the visibility would be you have not met the reserve bid, and that's all they need to know is that they haven't yet achieved uh, an ante into the game, as it were, for those poker players out there. So if the bidding doesn't reach the reserve price and there's no sale, you don't have to... Uh, commit yourself to anything, provided you state that up front that there is a reserve bid. Um, terms and conditions of pricing need to be considered, obviously. Uh, we need to understand when we're doing this, what's involved in transportation? Who's going to pay for it? Um, what are the INCO terms that we're going to use, especially if we're going international? And you know, what is the impact of customs so that when you're comparing these bids, you still have the same requirement to go through and do your due diligence on what is the true total landed cost, total cost of ownership, as opposed to simply uh, what is the lowest price. And then what if there is a quality problem? How will I handle returns? You can make this part of the e-auction process as well. In fact, I strongly recommend it be a part of it. So when you're choosing your e-auction type, You want to make sure that you're um, taking a look at, from a buy side, do I want to look at reverse price, uh, a sealed bid auction where people just make a bid and, and I make a choice based on whatever's the best of those. Um, we'll get in a little bit to what we mean by a Yankee auction, a Japanese auction, or a Brazilian auction. And on the sell side, uh, whether we're looking at an English auction, fixed price, sealed bid, a Vickery auction, negotiated price, uh, aggregate demand, penny auctions, and the classic Dutch auction. So th some of these apply more to business to consumer. Some apply business to business. Uh, again, with small and medium enterprises, you could be going through um, either, uh, either of these different types of methods, or some of them might be outside of your range simply because you're not in the business to consumer business. So different influences that we're going to have for this. Um, what is the industry standard? Again, uh, what do other people in our marketplace do? Which type of auction is most common that our customers and or suppliers would be most familiar with that we'd like to use? Uh, what's the standard within our country? Uh, different countries have different um, positive experience with different types of auctions. And in fact, there might be legislative requirements that prevent certain auctions. Uh, and, and then how much money needs to be spent on advertising to get the auction set up? Um, and, and I use advertising as a loose term in this case. <clears throat> so in any case, uh, any of these types of auctions can be developed in-house or can be provided by uh, an application provider. So if we look at the English e-auction, which is one of our more common ones, um, also known as a proxy English auction. There's actually a number of names for English auctions. The best use for this is when you've got single units and you provide price visibility. 
Um, buyers are looking to procure goods and services. Um, sellers want to get the buyer to bid the highest price they're willing to pay. So it's your typical forward auction setup. eBay would be an example of this, Craigslist, uh, any of those type of uh, consumer sites that you might be familiar with. And then once the auction's duration is finished, bidding stops and whoever has the highest price being offered, that's the person to whom you sell the product. Uh, if the product's not sold, you can do a reserve bid. Um, there is a, a reserve price auction available within the English auction setup. Um, a word of caution, some internet auctions have uh, what's called a robot or a bidding agent that automatically increases bids up to a predetermined maximum to try and, and push people upwards. With a reverse price e-auction, the price is descending. This is more common for you if you're on the uh, purchasing side and you're looking to buy something and you want the suppliers to underbid one another to give you the best price that you can get. For our audience, this is probably the more common one that we're looking at. So when you're taking part in an English auction in this manner, um, buyers try to outbid fellow buyers without paying more than the value of the item. And again, that's why it's important to do your market homework beforehand and understand what the true value is. Um, sellers are trying to bid the lowest price that they are willing to provide the item for. So the business will set a minimum bid that acts as the start, the reserve price, anything higher than the minimum uh, undisclosed to the buyer uh, indicates that the lowest price that the seller is willing to accept. A seller is not required to complete a sale if no bid meets its reserve price. And likewise, if you're a purchaser using this in a reverse auction type, um, you're not required to make a purchase if they don't come in as low as what you're looking for. Basically, selling stops when time is run out. Uh, a lot of internet auctions refer to this as English auction with a reserve price. Um, with a fixed price e-auction, we're looking to procure goods and services or get a guaranteed price for an item if we're uh, trying to sell something. So the, the setting of a fixed price can limit the number of buyers because you set it up beforehand and some of them may say, well, I'm not interested in bidding on that, so it gives them right away an opportunity. Um, we don't have uh, a link that we're going to use here, um, but basically most people are familiar with eBay and when you go in, quite often you'll see a, a site set up and they'll say bidding starts at, and so that's what we're dealing with there. In a, a sealed bid auction, it's a short process. Uh, if we generally know what the value of the goods are, this is the, the type we might want to go with. Uh, the impact of the price can be influenced by marketing, so if we're looking to sell something using this methodology, we might uh, push the value of the product using different marketing tools to convince people that it's worth more. Uh, and if we're looking to purchase, we might uh, push in the other direction to suggest that while the value of the product is high, our need for it is not such that we need to overbid and therefore push the suppliers to start suggesting a lower price to us. <coughs> So um, sales price gets driven up or down based on whatever pre-marketing you do with this. Uh, again, this is looking for a quick turnaround. With the sealed bid auction, at whatever the start time is, everybody puts in their bid, and then you just go through them and select what it is. There's not a lot of back and forth. Uh, people aren't able to see what the other's prices are. Now the Vickery e-auction. It's an unusual scenario. Let's the supplier uh, purchase goods and services without extending the price comfortable with. If there's industry collaboration, this is the type of auction you might want to go with. Um, <clears throat> sometimes it's seen in charity auctions uh, where there's you know camaraderie and, and collaboration because everybody wants to get the, the highest price for the charity. So. <clears throat> Uh, from a buyer's perspective, you're looking to get goods and services. Research is the key. 
um, know the market value for the item. If you're selling, uh, use this format when the value of items is unknown uh, and you want to make sure that you have an understanding of what the best price is. So it's a, a sealed bid auction. Um, so we have in, in this example, bidder A bids $10 and bidder B bids $12. So what happens is bidder B wins the auction because they had the highest bid, but they're only going to pay what the second price is. Uh, and this also works in reverse when suppliers are providing the lowest price to the purchaser. Uh, when you're taking a look at it, you can uh, you can take the lowest bid and they pay what the second or they sell to you at what the second lowest bid would have been. In the Yankee auction, here we tend to deal with multiple units. So here we've had the bids come in, and supplier A has offered, first of all, we want, we want to purchase 10 units. So supplier A has offered five units available at $75. Supplier B has uh, three units available at $80. Supplier C has six units available at $90. And supplier D has 10 units available at $95. In the Yankee auction, we're going to start with the lowest price and just bid the quantity that we need until we get to the total quantity we want to have on hand. So we will buy the five from supplier A at the lowest price. We will take the next three from supplier B, and we'll take two of the six from supplier C to ensure that we get the 10 units we want at the lowest possible price we can achieve. Now the negotiated price e auction um, if there's multiple competing products and the supplier wants to get some market volume out of them uh, this is an option for them to go through negotiated uh, e auction pricing <clears throat> so the duration of the auction ends the bidding stops any product that's unsold uh, can then be put on a reserve bid, and then you would typically go through the English reserve price auction. Um, Priceline works in a, a similar manner to this, so you would go on and, and uh, hotel bids and things of that nature. And uh, questions come through in a Yankee bid, do we factor in the cost of cutting three purchase orders for suppliers A, B, and C rather than just a single purchase order to supplier D? And again, that's uh, a great question that goes to the strategy. We all have different cost components in what is the real cost of creating a purchase order. And if there's not that much difference in the price, there is the possibility that it's not worth negotiating and dealing with, well, it's not the negotiation, but it's not worth dealing with three separate um, uh, suppliers, so we're, we're back to the Yankee auction here in this discussion. Um, you know, at, at a difference of D being able to provide all 10 at $95, and I multiply that out to 950 versus 795, did my uh, $155 get eaten up by having to create three purchase orders? So we do want to make sure that we take a look at that and have an understanding of what is the true cost. Again, I mentioned earlier, you want the total cost of ownership when you're dealing with these. Um, so aggregated demand e-auction, um, we, we uh, Groupon Toronto, Groupon is a, a type of situation for this. So. Um, Priced items get posted, buyers indicate their willingness to buy, and when enough items are sold, the price drops to a specified amount. Um, this is quite common in B2C, less common in business-to-business -business transactions. The classic Dutch e-auction. Uh, this is called this because of the flower market in the Netherlands. Um, it's an open descending price auction, so uh, very similar to the Yankee auction in reverse. Uh, so someone has the, 
the product to sell, we're looking to purchase 10. Um, a has five items available at $75. Um, three items available at 80. Six items available at 90. So buyer C, uh, we're going to sell the six units to them that we have to offer first because we want to get the highest price. Then we'll sell the three to buyer B, and then we'll sell the one that we have left to buyer A. Um, when we set up things like the Dutch e-auction, we want to make sure that we put parameters at the front that say, once a bid is made, you have to honor it. So the fact that uh, A now might say, well, you know what, I'm not going to take just one, I wanted five. Well, you, you bid asking for this, and we're supplying it, so we're going to give you the one, you have to take it. More importantly, uh, C, who agreed to pay 90, has to take it and can't just say, well, I just want to pay 75 because those guys are only going to pay 75. So you have to set this up up front, and people have to understand in the auction process what is it that they're dealing with. <clears throat> Penny e-auctions, I'm not going to focus on this. If you're familiar with Quibids, um, basically you get a voucher type of monetary system that you use to exchange for goods value. Again, this is much more popular like Groupon uh, with the uh, business to consumer and even consumer to consumer setup. There are other multiple unit e-auctions. So in the Japanese e-auction, it's a reverse style buying auction and it ends when there's only one supplier remaining. Again, you have to set the terms up out front that say uh, when you make a bid, you have to commit to it. So uh, what we would generally refer to as contract A in the RFQ business. And on the Brazilian e-auction, the buyer sets the price that they're willing to pay for the lot and the seller bids on how many units they're willing to provide at that price. So the buying continues until the buyer has all the product that they want. Um, all requirements are fulfilled. And again, you want to make sure that uh, everyone commits to, once they put in a bid, it is a, a legal requirement that they will follow through. So there are risks and liabilities that we face, as there are in just about everything we do. Uh, under the barriers, there may be internal barriers within our own company. We might not be able to set up e-commerce systems easily. Uh, there could be external market pressures that uh, don't promote the use of e-auctions. Uh, in some industries and in some countries, it might even be considered a form of uh, collusion, which it shouldn't be. It certainly isn't here in most cases. Um, of course, we want to be careful of fraud. You want protection from suppliers who are not providing the quality that they advertise. If they're saying that this is what they're going to supply to you, you want to make sure that it actually is what they're going to supply. Um, especially important when you're dealing with international purchases on an e-auction. And from a selling perspective, uh, you want protection against buyers who don't carry through on the purchase. In other words, they make the bid, you set everything in motion, and then they go, hey, you know what, I'm not going to buy it after all. Obviously a major issue. Um, lack of partner interaction. Because you're doing this communication through the e-auction process, and you, you do have hopefully good specs, technical drawings, everything else of that nature, um, but you're not creating the relationships. This is obviously what you would do for transactional items. Uh, you may use the e-auction to begin strategic items um, for your company, but in the long run you want to then turn those into strategic relationships at some point. And of course, misrepresented products or information. It could be that the products are inappropriate for e-auction, um, that the information uh, that was provided leaves the organization liable because it, uh, it is stated in a manner that, that doesn't comply with what you're actually delivering. So again, important at the start to make sure that we've got all the right departments, including legal and finance, involved in the e-auction setup. <clears throat> then we have our payment considerations as far as cost goes. Uh, once we get through the auction process, long before we start, we should have decided how are we going to set up processing fees? Are we going to do online banking? Are we going to do a purchase order and a check system? Um, what fees do we need to face and how are we going to recover them? 
Are there uh, monthly fees for payment that takes a longer time to pay? Um, from a privacy perspective, uh, we need security in terms of dollars. We need security in terms of our reputation, our risk mitigation. Uh, do we let everyone know that we're going to e-auction? And if we do, uh, as we go through the auction process, does that open us up to criticism about the quality of our product? Um, are we, you know, suggesting that we would step into a relationship based solely on price when our customers expect us to be purchasing based on quality? Um, again, from a fraud perspective, we want to make sure that we have audit features. If we see suspicious transaction behavior in the e-auction itself, we want to identify who that is and determine whether we should eliminate them from the auction. And before we do that, we have to go back to the legal standing and find out, can we eliminate them? So again, inappropriate behavior within the auction needs to be something that's uh, stated up front that a person can be removed should they not follow protocol. From liability, we need to understand what's our coverage, if there is a problem, um, how much risk are we facing, and again, inco terms and, and such become a part of that. Uh, international payment processing. We, if we are normally a domestic um, company, whether we are buying or selling, and we open up e-auction to reach international markets, we need to make sure that we work with our bank and freight forwarding and whoever else is involved to ensure we understand international payment requirements and processes. Um, some tips to make sure that we avoid those problems. Um, Set up an escrow service uh, with risks and costs associated. Um, set up our terms of agreement. Don't disclose any financial information uh, unless we know why it's being collected. Um, privacy and security, uh, same thing. Legitimate payment forms would include uh, electronic funds transfer, payment on receipt, line of credit. We want to check our billing timing. Uh, we only want to bill once the shipment has, once the product is shipped, or are we setting it up uh, so that we bill prior to bill to the product? We need to make sure we have an understanding, as we do with any international transaction, of at what point does the money exchange hands. Online processing usability, we're referring here to making sure that everyone has adequate training not just within our company for setting it up, but the members who are doing the bidding, the participants that we've invited into bid, we want to make sure that they understand how the bid process works and, and how to use it properly. Um, most of the apps that we would uh, hire someone else to put in place for us are fairly straightforward and will come with some simple training. If we develop it in-house, we want to make sure that we understand the terms we use in-house might not translate well outside, so we want to make sure that we do provide some training before people start bidding to ensure they don't make mistakes. <laughs> Operational reports, we want to make sure we've got dashboards available. Again, we want to see how many times are people visiting, what's participation like, uh, is the e-auction working for us, uh, is it something that we do want to continue as our long-term strategy. Uh, as with everything we do, we want KPIs to measure the results. And then strategic reports, track the performance and track the benefit. Did we actually save money? If we had not gone to e-auction, what were we willing to pay in purchasing this? Or in the case of selling, what were we expecting to sell this for and did we sell it for more? So you want to make sure that you've got an understanding of did the strategy pay off? And again, this is all stuff you want to set up at the beginning before you begin the e-auction process. Our technical requirements, uh, environmental controls, we want to make sure that we've got the confidence in the infrastructure. Um, whether it's internal or external, we want to make sure that people understand uh, how to set it up properly and what happens if we get a glitch, uh, too much web traffic. Does that shut down the bid? Um, is, is there anything to do with the, the speed at which people are accessing? If we're dealing with other countries, they may not have the highest ISDN, you know, whatever the latest and greatest speed for internet access is. Uh, they might have some slower uh, access points. So you've got to make sure that you're able to provide all the material they need to be part of the bid process uh, if they're on a slower system. Uh, with marketing controls, um, 
you know, we want to make sure that whatever exposure we get through this, that it's a positive exposure for our company. Um, data attributes, we want to make sure that we understand what is the product, what price we're looking for, what are vendor requirements. In other words, uh, who would we invite into the bid and what would stop somebody from being a potential bidder. Um, and buying and selling attributes, how are we going to manage this? From a security perspective, uh, is it acceptable to suppliers to go into this bid process? Do we need to sign uh, confidentiality agreements and non-disclosure agreements? We probably do, and we probably should have that set up ahead of time. What about security of payment? How do we know that it was transferred to the right account? What about false identification? How do we prevent somebody from hacking the site and getting in and putting in bids or uh, telling someone they accepted the bid and providing a false account number to have them transfer uh, finances to? and of course access problems themselves within security. <clears throat> so if we're dealing with an outsourced software provider, um, we might not have much ability to brand the website our way, so our marketing controls are going to be limited. If we're doing it in-house, we certainly have more ability to put our own marketing brand on the e-auction itself. Um, Industry knowledge can be leveraged when we go outside. We may have a limitation on that when we do it inside. Uh, from the website itself, uh, if we go outside and have them provide the e-auction process for us, obviously they host it. Uh, we can host it internally if we do it ourselves, um, but we might also look, we might set everything up ourselves and still have it hosted externally, depending on how our IT systems are set up at work, obviously. From an ethics perspective, obviously we want to make sure that everyone's above board. Um, we want to make sure that, that we focus on accuracy and confidentiality, that only qualified suppliers are invited to bid. We don't want to invite people and then say, oh, well, thanks for bidding, but we wouldn't do business with you anyway. Uh, awards based on submission, we want to make sure that we go through the standard clarity that we would have in an RFQ process, the transparency that one would expect. Um, there's no governing body over e-auctions, at least not in Canada, so we tend to defer to the ethics such as the Purchasing Management Association of Canada Code of Ethics. It gives us a solid foundation for the standards of behavior and ethical conduct that we expect in purchasing. Um, so when we engage in e-auctions, we just try to keep that same standard that we would hold to ourselves for an RFQ process. Uh, when we're selling, we want to make sure that uh, the representation of the goods that are being sold are accurate. We want to follow good business practices, and we don't want to set up customers uh, and invite them in to bid on product and then say to them, oh, sorry, uh, we don't believe that you have the credit to do this, so we're not going to sell it to you now. Again, we want to make sure that we take care of all this stuff up front and avoid disqualification midway through. Um, if we do find uh, one of our participants behaving unethically, then we want to make sure that we have a process that was set up up front so that we can disqualify them from the e-auction and possibly from all future e-auctions with us as well. Uh, the B2C sites have developed a crowdsourcing mechanism. So if you go on to uh, eBay, for instance, and check out, you know, bidder, uh, I like to buy at, you know, at house.com, uh, has a habit of making false presentations, then you'll actually see that there's a, a rating system and you're able to look at it and say, oh, I'm not going to sell to this guy because according to this, 85% of the time he backs out of it at the last minute. So we don't have that in a business-to-business -business setup typically, uh, but if it's a mature industry that you're in, it's quite possible that you've got that type of setup available. Um, so you want to set up feedback profiles and you want to use this to understand these potential partners that you're dealing with uh, are set up the way you want them to be and, and they're following the same ethical standards. So if you're a buyer, um, excuse me, sorry, uh, understand the business environment. You want to make sure that you talk to people in the same industry. Um, you want to make sure that you've got a mechanism to qualify suppliers. Uh, use marketing and promotional tools that you would normally use. Um, are the specs of what you're buying clear? 
you want to make sure that you understand, you know, there, there might be a lot of work required within the organization to identify this before you put it out to auction. Uh, reviewing different e-auction sites and their functionality is a good idea. To find out if there's an industry standard, look for functionality. Um, is the seller warrantied, and if so, by whom? You know, know who you're doing business with, do a credit check on them, make sure that, that you understand who they are. And if they're selling through a third-party e-auction site, uh, do a background check through that site and say, you know, I'm interested in bidding on this, I've been invited in. Um, before I do, I want to make sure that I understand that this is uh, a reputable company and, and that uh, you guys stand behind them. And do you have a communications plan in hand to respond to any inquiries that come through? You should have some FAQ set up beforehand. Do a dry run within your company with people who have never dealt with this type of stuff and have them come through and come up with the questions that, that they need to ask based on having participated. Uh, it helps you set up an FAQ sheet so that when suppliers do call, you've already got the answers in front of you. Uh, and again, having that um, one day open session where you have everyone available to offer questions uh, is pretty good. I know we're getting close to the end of the time here. We're almost through the slides, and I do want to leave some time for Q&A for those who do have any. Uh, I've answered some as they've come up. So um, reviewing pricing considerations and payment options, again, you want to look at term, ship, and currency. These are things we talked about. From a seller's perspective, again, you want to understand the business environment. You, you don't go out and try to sell stuff until you've done your marketing ahead of time, one hopes. So review your marketing mix. How do you promote your product? How do you categorize it? Who is the target market that you're dealing with? Um, how are you going to satisfy the sale? In other words, once somebody agrees to buy it, are you taking care of shipping? Are you taking care of transportation, packaging requirements, insurance to get it there? Um, what other things need to be dealt with? You want to look at your costing components and make sure that the price that you're asking for as a minimum bid is going to satisfy your needs for that. Is there a communication plan to respond to inquiries? Again, the same thing. Run through it with your own staff and get some FAQs built out of that. Uh, again, is the buyer warranted? Uh, is someone who's invited in to buy someone that you would actually have as a customer? Would, would they pass your financial check, your credit checks? Or do you want to make it COD, which is a possibility as well, or COS, uh, cash on shipment? Um, and how do you promote good customer service? So once you've, you've done a sale through e-auction, obviously if you're on the selling side, you want to make sure that you get the best long-term relationship you can, same as you do on the purchasing side. So you want to make sure that, that you've got uh, the opportunity to continue to sell to these people going forward. So we come back to the question, are e-auctions right for you? And I know for a lot of people, you're, you're now looking at this going, wow, that was a lot to breeze through. We will have the webinar available. And as I mentioned, there is an e-book available as well uh, so that you can access that. And it allows you to take some time and digest it a little bit more and go through it one more time. But in identifying whether or not it's a good fit, you want to make sure, first of all, are these goods or services that are highly valuable, that can generate savings by going to auction, or is the price so standard in the marketplace right now that there's really no point in even making an effort because everyone's going to come back with the same price within a few pennies? Um, is it a good or service that you can define precisely, that you can use pictures, specs, or drawings? Because if you can't, it's kind of hard to understand through an e-auction, is this the product that I really want? Do I want to bid on this? Or alternatively, does the person who's bidding on this from me understand what they're really getting? Um, so you, and also, you want a sufficient number of players in the market who are interested. If you're trying to sell something or trying to buy something and there's only one or two participants in the auction, Obviously, you're not going to have a huge impact on, on drawing the price, whereas when there's more people available to participate, you obviously wind up with a, a greater competitiveness among them. So it got us in just right on time. Uh, <laughs> thank you for attending the e-auction webinar. I am going to stay online for a, a little bit longer. If anyone does have any further questions, please, by all means, go into the uh, Q&A question box and, and type them in now. Um, we'll give it another couple of minutes and see if anything comes up.
So will this presentation be available for download? Yes, we will have it archived on the PMAC uh, site. I'm not familiar with the details, but I'm sure that uh, if you sign in through our webpage, you can find the details easily, or you can always contact me, rcleveland at pmac.ca, and I'll get the information to you. Uh, how do we get the ebook? Exactly the same thing. Um, just send me an email. Actually, check on our website first, but I don't think it's up there yet, so wait a few days before you do that. Uh, send me an email, and I will make sure that we get the ebook available for download from our members only site. And if you're not a member, uh, let me know, and we'll see what we can do for you. Uh, so yeah, so the literature should be available next week. Um, it has been produced. Uh, I don't think we've got it uploaded to the site yet, uh, but we will do that as quickly as we can. Understanding that we have our conference coming up in Ottawa, June 12th through 14th, and so we are obviously very busy preparing for that, and hopefully many of you will be there uh, because it is uh, an excellent opportunity for networking and for uh, further understanding of what's happening in the supply chain world. So on that note, I thank everyone for attending. Uh, it has been a pleasure to share these ideas with you. Hopefully something of value came through on this. And uh, we will email the info to everyone on the webinar. So there's your answer on how you'll get uh, all that information. Uh, it is available on pmac.ca uh, under PMAC News and the category is 1108, but I'm sure you'll find it by looking up um, uh, e-auction. So thank you very much. Have a great day.